Siberia is a vast territory in Asia, rich in oil and other minerals. How did it happen that Siberia became part of the Tsardom of Russia, a relatively small state in Eastern Europe, which shortly before this was able to achieve independence from the Golden Horde? The chain of events, thanks to which Siberia became part of Russia, began in 1547. By this time, the Golden Horde ceased to exist, having split into several independent khanates of Kazan, Astrakhan, Crimean, Kazakh and Sibir, as well as the Nogai Horde. Unlike other fragments of the Golden Horde, the Crimean Khanate became dependent on the Ottoman Empire, which, on the one hand, deprived it of a certain level of independence, but at the same time allowed the Crimean Khan, if necessary, to count on the help of the Ottoman Sultan. As for the Grand Duchy of Moscow, after the liberation from the power of the Golden Horde, it significantly increased, incorporating the territory of the rest of the Russian principalities that were previously dependent on the Golden Horde. In 1547, the Grand Duke of Moscow Ivan IV, better known as Ivan the Terrible, takes the title of Tsar of all Russia and focuses on confrontation with the Grand Duchy of Lithuania for control of territories that were occupied by Russian principalities before the Mongol invasion. In order to win the fight against the richer Grand Duchy of Lithuania, Ivan the Terrible needed money and he could get it by establishing control over the trade route from Europe to Asia, although for this the Russian kingdom needed to subjugate the Kazan and Astrakhan Khanates. As for the Khanate of Sibir, its conquest was not included in the plans of Ivan the Terrible, since no one knew about the presence of oil in Siberia, and it did not possess special value in the 16th century. Ivan the Terrible set himself very ambitious goals, for the implementation of which military force was required. This force was the Streltsy Corps formed in 1550. In fact, the Streltsy Corps were an analogue of the Ottoman Genissaries, who by the middle of the 16th century were able to prove their high efficiency more than once. Strengthening the army quickly gave results. In 1552, the Russian kingdom occupied Kazan and included the Kazan Khanate. Continuing its expansion to the south in 1556, the Tsardom of Russia managed to include the Astrakhan Khanate into its structure, which made it possible to establish control over the entire length of the Volga River, which in the described period of time was an important trade route. The strengthening of the Tsardom of Russia made its neighbors think about their own security, therefore, in 1555, Yediger, the ruler of the Khanate of Sibir, recognized vassal dependence on Ivan IV, and Ismail, the Bey of the Nogai Horde, in 1557. After Ivan the Terrible established control over the Volga, he turned his attention to the north, namely to the Livonian Confederation. Historians and chroniclers give many reasons for the start of the Livonian War, but the main reason was that the Tsardom of Russia needed control over the Livonian ports. The fact is that after the capture of the Livonian ports, Ivan the Terrible would have controlled the entire length of the trade route from Europe to Asia, and, consequently, the Tsardom of Russia would be able to receive huge income. The Livonian War began in 1558, and very soon the Russian army had to face on the battlefield not only the army of the Livonian Confederation, but also the armies of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, Polish and Swedish kingdoms, as well as the Denmark-Norway Union. Meanwhile, the Khanate of Sibir was restless. In 1563, Kukum from the Shabanid dynasty, with the support of the Khan of Bukhara, invaded the territory of the Siberian Khanate and, with the help of an army consisting of Nogais and Kazakhs, was able to overthrow Khan Yediger and seize power. Some time after establishing control over the Khanate of Sibir, Kukum refused to pay tribute to the Tsardom of Russia. However, Ivan the Terrible simply could not react to Kukum's impudence, since his army was bogged down in battles in Livonia. In addition, the Crimean Khan, knowing full well that most of the army of the Tsardom of Russia was in the north in Livonia, began to increasingly raid the border territories. In 1571, the army of the Crimean Tatars was able to reach Moscow and plunder the city, with the exception of the Kremlin, the walls of which turned out to be impregnable for the Tatars. However, the new campaign of the Crimean Khan against Moscow in 1572 turned out to be extremely unsuccessful, 
since the army of the Crimean Khan was almost completely destroyed in the Battle of Melody. Nevertheless, the Livonian War continued and the Tsardom of Russia had to make more and more efforts to resist the increased number of opponents. Watching the problems of the Tsardom of Russia, Khan Kukum grew bolder. In 1573, his nephew Mehmetkul raided the territory of the Tsardom of Russia, while ruining the possessions of the Stroganovs. This is what became a fatal mistake for Kukum. The Stroganovs were a wealthy and influential family of landowners who tried not to forgive insults. Having suffered losses, they decided to take revenge without fail. Since, due to the protracted Livonian War, Ivan the Terrible simply could not send an army to fight Kukum, he allowed the Stroganovs to assemble their own armed detachments to counter the raids, and also granted them the right to manage all the territories conquered in the Khanate of Sibir. The Stroganovs began to recruit Cossacks and prepare a campaign against Khan Kukum. By 1578, they managed to assemble a large detachment of battle-hardened warriors, which was headed by Adaman Yermak Timofayevich. The first two campaigns against the Khanate of Sibir in 1578 and in 1579 turned out to be unsuccessful for the Yermak detachment, since they simply could not find a suitable waterway. On September 1, 1581, the third campaign began. The detachment of Yermak Timofayevich, which, in addition to 500 Volga Cossacks, included Tatars, as well as Lithuanians and Germans who were captured during the Livonian War, who were promised freedom and part of the booty in exchange for participating in the campaign, plunged into 80 boats and began to move upstream Chusavaya River. Yermak had at his disposal a small but excellent armed detachment, consisting of 840 experienced soldiers. Having reached the Tagil Pass, Yermak's detachment planned to drag their boats into the Zuravlik River and descend along it to get into the heart of the Khanate of Sibir. Since it was necessary to drag boats over a long distance, Yermak's detachment had to spend the winter on a mountain pass, having built a small fortified camp. In the spring of 1582, Yermak's detachment rafted along the Zuravlik, Baranchá and Tajil rivers and reached the Tura River and continued moving deep into the Khanate of Sibir. The first combat clashes between the Cossacks and the Siberian Tatars took place near the Yupankin's yurts. The local prince Yupanchi ordered his men to fire on Yermak's boats with bows, but return fire from cannons forced the Tatar cavalry to flee. Thus, after a short skirmish, the village of Prince Yupanchi fell into the hands of Yermak, which the Cossacks plundered, after which they continued to move along the Tura River. The Cossacks plundered all the Tatar villages that they met on the way, and on August 1, after a short battle, Yermak's detachment occupied the town of Chinjitura, in which they managed to capture a large number of Siberian furs, silver and gold. The first serious battle took place in the place where the Tura River flows into the Tobol. Yermak's detachment was opposed by the united army of six Tatar princes, but firearms, as well as the vast military experience of Yermak's people, ensured them a decisive victory. After the battle, Rich booty fell into the hands of the Cossacks. Yermak's detachment moved downstream of the Tobol River, defeating the detachments of the Tatar Murs and occupying their towns. The well-being of Yermak's detachment grew with each occupied town, as did the desire to quickly get to the capital of the Khanate of Sibir, since the Cossacks planned to take the richest booty there. Meanwhile, Khan Kukum hastily gathered forces planning to meet Yermak's detachment not far from his capital on the Chuvash Cape at the confluence of the Tobol River with the Irtish. In addition to his own forces, Kukum called for help from the Vogel and Ostiak princes with their squads. There is an opinion that under the command of Kukum there were about 15,000 soldiers, but given that the population of the Khanate of Sibir was small, it is safe to say that the size of Kukum's army most likely did not exceed 5,000 soldiers. Kukum entrusted the command of the army to Mehmetkul, while he himself watched the battlefield from the mountain. The Tatars prepared in advance for the upcoming battle by erecting a notch, which was supposed to provide protection from the fire of cannons and muskets. The battle took place on October 26, 1582. When Yermak saw the enemy army ready for battle, he gave his detachment the order to moor to the shore and launch an attack. The cannons mounted on the boats began firing at the enemy as soon as he was within range of a shot. Very soon, the boats moored to the shore, 
and as soon as Yermak's detachment began landing, a hail of arrows fell upon him, which, however, turned out to be ineffective. The fact is that the Tatars were afraid to fall under the fire of firearms and therefore fired from the maximum possible distance. While the Cossacks were landing on the shore, Mamekkel ordered his men to launch an attack, planning to take the enemy by surprise and force him to retreat to the boats, but it was too late. When the attacking army of Kukum reached the bank of the river, the Cossacks had already managed to form a square and met it with the fire of cannons and muskets. The Ostiaks and Vogels advancing in the forefront faltered after the very first shots and, having stopped the attack, hastily left the battlefield. The Tatars were left face to face with Yermak's detachment, but the numerical advantage was still on their side, so they continued the attack. During the attack, the Tatars sought to quickly reach the ranks of the enemy, planning to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And despite the losses incurred from the fire of cannons, they succeeded. A hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued, but it did not go as Kukum had planned. The fact is that Yermak's detachment consisted of battle-hardened warriors with vast combat experience, so the Cossacks not only did not flinch, but also began to push the Tatars. The Tatar army faltered, and Mamekkel, trying to restore discipline and organize a new attack, was wounded and almost captured. After Mamekkel was wounded, panic began in the Tatar army and it fled from the battlefield. Kukum, who was watching the battle from the mountain, also fled leaving his capital city of Iskir. Yermak ordered not to pursue the enemy, in place of this he took the capital of the Khanate of Sibir, abandoned by Kukum. As soon as it became clear that Kukum was not making any attempts to recapture his capital, the Ostiaks and Siberian Tatars who lived in the vicinity of Iskir began to come to Yermak with gifts and food supplies. In turn, Yermak began to demand that they swear allegiance to the Russian Tsar and promised protection in exchange for paying Yasak. Sometime after the defeat of Kukum's troops, Yermak's detachment began to lack food, so when he learned that Lake Abalak, located 15 kilometers from Iskir, was rich in fish, he sent a detachment of 20 Cossacks to replenish food supplies. On December 5, this detachment was attacked by the Tatars under the command of Mometkal and defeated. Upon learning of this, Yermak began hunting for the remnants of the Tatar army. On February 23, 1583, Yermak's detachment managed to overtake the Tatar troops near the Shanshinsky Tract. As a result of a bloody battle, Yermak managed to completely defeat the Tatar army and capture Mamekkel, who was sent to Moscow. After this defeat, Kukum did not have the strength left to try to confront Yermak in open battle, so he switched to guerrilla tactics. Meanwhile, Yermak continued to establish control over the territory of the Siberian Khanate, which by this time had in fact ceased to exist, having broken up into small principalities. While the process of conquering the Khanate of Sibir was going on, the embassy that Yermak sent at the end of 1582 reached Moscow. Ivan the Terrible generously endowed the Cossacks and sent 500 soldiers under the command of Semyon Bokovsky to help them, who only reached Iskir in November 1584. Despite the arrival of reinforcements, Yermak's luck turned away, since in the winter of 1584, due to severe frosts and deep snow, the Cossacks could not get food by hunting. Famine began in Iskir. The winter, which turned out to be very severe, did not survive most of the soldiers, including their commander Semyon Bokovsky, as well as a significant number of Cossacks. By spring, Yermak's detachment was significantly reduced, which forced him to avoid major clashes with the Tatars until reinforcements arrived. Taking advantage of this, Mirza Karachar rebelled. With the help of cunningly arranged ambushes, he managed to defeat the detachments of the chieftains Ivan Koltso and Yakov Mikhailov, after which he, confident that Yermak had practically no forces left, tried to block Iskir. However, Karacha could not achieve the desired result, since the Cossacks made a sortie on June 12, 1585, forcing him to hastily retreat. Despite the acute shortage of forces, the Cossacks, in anticipation of reinforcements, were forced to make raids in order to replenish food supplies. During one of these raids, Yermak, at the head of a detachment of 50 Cossacks, stopped for the night at the mouth of the Vagi River. At night, the detachment was attacked by Kukum and almost completely destroyed, and Yermak himself drowned trying to swim to the boats after being wounded. After the death of Yermak, 
the remnants of his detachment decided to leave Iskir. However, the fate of the Khanate of Sibir was already a foregone conclusion, since Ivan the Terrible did not plan to give up new territories. In 1586, the first fortified city of Jumen was founded, after which the Russian army began to gradually establish control over the territories of the former Khanate of Sibir. As for Kukum, despite the offer of Ivan the Terrible to enter his service, he tried to fight the Russian army using partisan methods. In 1598, having lost all his army, he fled from the territory of the Khanate of Sibir and was killed by Kalmyks or Nogais. After establishing control over the Khanate of Sibir, the Russian kingdom began to conquer the rest of Siberia up to the border with China. The Russian detachments did not meet serious resistance, since the tribes inhabiting Siberia did not have their own states and, consequently, their own armies. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to my channel and click on the bell so as not to miss new videos.